Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. And today we're going to talk about conspiracy theorists or conspiracy theories, rather. They seem to be very popular nowadays. I don't know if they're more popular than before, but they certainly seem to me to be so. I've come under some criticisms from some conspiracy theorists on social media. So I've looked into it and I decided to get some guests on to talk about it. Today's guest is a lecturer in politics in the Department of Political Economy at King's College, London, UK. Rod Daycomb, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. So before we can talk about conspiracy theories, how would you define it? What is a conspiracy theory? Yeah, I think this is really important because the way we talk about conspiracy theories in kind of general conversation isn't necessarily the kind of thing that interests me most. I think it's probably useful having a bit of a, a chat to start with, kind of pulling those things apart. Right. So first of all, I think for me, conspiracy theories are ways of interpreting what's going on in the world. They're ways that all of us, I think, to an extent, uh develop tools in which we can explain what's going on in a way which makes sense to us and is, I guess, up to a point comforting, right? So conspiracy theories in a nutshell are something like the idea that there is a secret, malign group of people, powerful people out there in the world who are shaping world events, but public events that affect you as an individual um, in ways in which the general population doesn't know. So you've got this kind of a secretive knowledge you understand what's happening most people don't and that truth is being hidden so it's uh, the idea that shadowy elites essentially essentially are kind of controlling things out there in the background now in some ways you're kind of going to say so what right but for some people that lens is the primary means through which they explain public events they that they understand politics and for some of them conspiracy theorizing is the primary means of political participation. Now, those people I find endlessly fascinating, but equally interesting, I think, is this idea that actually when we break it down, if we take that kind of nutshell definition, I'm willing to bet, because I know I do, that you probably hold some kind of conspiracy theory belief, right? Because almost everybody does. Sure. Um, when I think conspiracy theorists, I don't think in terms of believing one or maybe two conspiracy theories, but there's people who seem to think that, you know, like if you believe that the World Trade Center attacks on September 11th was, you know, the government of the United States was behind them, then you're probably inclined to believe the CIA assassinated Kennedy, uh, that the government's behind COVID. I mean, you know, there's a whole list of things that do the FDR was in on or, or had, you know, foreknowledge of the attacks on Pearl Harbor. They tend to cluster together. So when, when did the, in history that you know of anyway, like you said, they've always been with us, but when do we first start to hear about large scale conspiracy theories like this? And I'm... What happened? Uh-oh. We got some kind of a lag going. You froze on me. Mark, I'm just going to check that you can still hear me. because um, I can hear you now, but you froze for a minute. Unstable. You froze for a minute. You are far away from me. Maybe that's why. I don't know. I don't know much about the technology. Did you hear my question? Yeah, you froze for me as well. But, um... So my question was, when do we first start to see just about so um yeah these these large scale conspiracy theories? I remember reading about, for instance, in the 1700s when they were talking about the Freemasons and they're you know they're trying to take over and they're controlling everything that sort of thing. So I know that it goes back at least then, but it's I imagine it has to go even further back than that. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always felt that this way of looking at the world, this way of interpreting things, um, is a, a really human thing to do. I think it's part of the human condition. And I'm willing to bet that as long as we've had organized societies, um, as long as we've had people to tell them to, um, people have been expressing their fears, expressing uh, how they, they feel about what's going on around them in terms of conspiracy theories. I'm pretty sure that that way of understanding the world has always been there. Um, in the kind of the modern sense, we tend to see it, 
I suppose, like formalized um, in scholarly sense, uh, terms, uh, probably from around the time of the Cold War, from the 60s onwards. Um, it's only recently become something, I think, that's had like a real sustained uh, period of scholarly attention, certainly within my field, within politics. Um, but looking through history, absolutely. And so let's think about why it is that we're treating, I think, differently now than probably we would have done previously. And so I think if you're talking about the 1700s, right, or if you're talking about any kind of historical period when society wasn't set up in the way that it, was, that it is today, conspiracy theories might have been a viable way of explaining political events, right? Because, you know, one and one thing we haven't said, and I should have said at the start, by the way, the conspiracy theories can be true. It's not the same as a falsehood or kind of obvious misinformation. It's yeah. just can be happening right now the idea that conspiracies could happen either kind of in uh, in high politics or even involved in ordinary people was probably a reasonable way of understanding what was going on we know there were plots um throughout the history um uh, of, of politics in the sense we recognize it today uh, we know that people were always kind of uh kind of thinking about things like this um machiavelli you know he was the the first real theorist um, of conspiracies, but thinking about it in a very different sense than the way we do. Now, this was part of the toolkit of a politician, right? The difference, I think, is that today conspiracy theories are not a very good way of explaining what's going on. Partly because society is, in, in lots of ways, much more open. Like the flow of information is much freer. Um, we have media, we have uh, the internet and social media. We are able to kind of question our politicians much, much more. And the idea that any of the things that you mentioned earlier on um, can reasonably and best be explained through the lens of conspiracism is implausible, right? Because anybody who's worked anywhere near public service knows that the idea that uh, a huge conspiracy of the scale that would have taken to, say, take the moon landings or to um, do a, a false flag attack um, on 9-11 or, or any of the, those kind of really out there things that sometimes you see people put forward, someone's going to talk. The idea that you could keep it secret in that way just is, is completely implausible, right? Um, and that's the, the disconnection, I think, between how historically we viewed conspiracy theories and how we see them today. Like They don't fit as well as explanations of contemporary society. Are there time periods where conspiracy theories are, tend to be more prevalent or, or more widely accepted than, than other times? Like what what would cause an uptick, I guess, for lack of a better word, in conspiracy theories? So I think to answer this question, I think we need to think about why it is people might believe conspiracy theories, like what purpose they feel. And like there's a lot of things, right? I mean, you know, partly often they're interesting, they can be grotesque, they can be um, right on the boundaries of, of, of what is acceptable socially. And, and as human beings, we love those kind of stories, right? We always have. Um, but really, conspiracy theories are explaining what's going on in the world in a way that has at its heart a degree of control. Like there is this shadowy group of elites who are in control. They are doing things. And if I can just get people to understand what's going on, if I can just do something about it, maybe I can wrest control back and get things going back in my favor again. Okay. Right? So that's essentially what they're about. And conspiracy theories, <laughs> theorists are the, the last believers in an ordered world, really, right? And so we tend to see spikes in conspiracy belief around periods of social and physical unrest, and particularly, and interestingly, during periods of pandemic. And the data isn't fantastic, but we've got some pretty good stuff out there. Um, and it will tell us this. It, it, it suggests that um, belief spikes around those periods. Now, I suppose one of the reasons why we might imagine that to be the case is because actually during those periods of time, and think of you know yourself um, back to the pandemic that we've just come in touch with, right? But still kind of coming towards the end of. That's been so disruptive for almost everybody. It's like a huge cataclysmic event, and the idea that it could have been a deliberate act, that it could have been somebody controlling things behind the scenes, is actually cognitively much more appealing to a lot of people than the truth, which is that really nobody was in control. And there are some things that we just don't have the ability to deal with effectively as a society. Um, and I'm quite sympathetic to that, I think. So yeah, we tend to see um, these sorts of things happening. What we don't see, I think, and the latest data suggests this, is that we're not living in a world that's any more conspiracist on the face of it 
than say 25, 30, 50 years ago, right? There's a relatively consistent trend in conspiracy belief, apart from these spikes. Wow. So what is, what are some of the more sticking conspiracy theories? Like, for instance, like, I mean, the Masons, obviously, that's, you know, that's the oldest one that I know of. It's that the Masons are running the world. But then, you know, you've got these other so-called, you know, like shadow organization, the Bilderbergers or the, the Trilateral Commission. So, like, what are the what are some of the biggest ones that have been around the longest that just don't seem to go away? Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of the things that you'll have seen emerge recently have their roots in some very old, um, very well-established conspiracy theories, but most of them uh, have their roots in kind of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that we would have seen put across in things like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Um, and just, uh, I'm sure you're you're aware of this a little bit if you've read up on the subject and you know the stuff, but just to, to be very clear, this is a completely discredited and rabidly anti-Semitic text. Um, which um, has been around for you know, at least the um, the late nineteenth century. It was created by Ru- by old. by Russians, right? In, in order to discredit the, the Zionist movement, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the um the origins are, is, are slightly shadowy, not quite as clear cut as we would like. But yes, in general, um, the Russian secret police had a hand in it. Uh, it is largely uh, plagiarized from a couple of earlier sources, one of which had nothing to do with the um the. Uh, the purposes for which it was kind of repackaged. Um, but ultimately, what it does is essentially establish the idea of a shadow government, right? And this is a shadow government which uh, is based on a kind of secretive Jewish vow. Um, it became hugely and horrendously popular during the early 20th century. Um, and you, know, you can imagine the, um, the horrific things that have been done in its stead. The reason I mention this is because a lot of the key tropes that you see and the protocols are absolutely echoed in recent conspiracies. Like whenever somebody says globalist, and they, and I'm certain, you know, in many cases, don't really understand kind of the origins and the context of what they're saying. But whenever they talk about globalism and kind of shadow world governments um, and a deep state, but its core is something quite similar to what you'll have seen in the protocols. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's difficult to see what's going on at the moment without understanding that history. I find it very, very interesting that you just pointed that out. And I'll tell you why. And look, I spent 25 years in prison, right? When While I was in prison, I co-authored a book that went against the entire culture of prison, how the culture of corrections encourages crime was our subtitle. We, My co-author and I put ourselves at odds with inmates, with staff, everybody. I'm a libertarian when it comes to politics. I'm a disciple of Ayn Rand. Like no one can justifiably call me like a conformist or I'm in, you know, with the establishment. But when I criticize conspiracy theorists, that's what they come with. Oh, you're part of the establishment. You're, you're a shill that, you know, that sort of thing. But the other day, somebody said, look at his last name. That says it all. And my last name is Leibowitz. <laughs> at first I didn't even pick up. I'm, I'm like, what the hell, what are they talking? But then I said, okay, that's, I, I get it now. I didn't bother to respond. I, you know, it was silly, but that that sort of uh, trope that uh, against Jews has such a powerful sort of sustainability, especially I think in times when people's lives aren't going well. I think people they do they look for somebody to blame. I mean, you know, the, the whole stab in the back after World War One because you know because Germany couldn't just have lost the war. There had to be some nefarious you know thing going on, whether it be the Jews or the generals or, or whomever. Somebody screwed them. So I, I just, I don't know, when you said that, maybe I've taken us off topic a little bit, but when you said the Jewish thing, it just reminded me of the guy the other day saying that, well, look at his last name. Yeah, no, I mean, so the mechanisms are the same, right? Um, like, you're absolutely right. I'm certain that at any one of those periods, what you probably got is a whole bunch of people whose lives have been turned upside down by some huge cataclysmic world events. What they want to do is explain it. They want to kind of find a really simple kind of malleable explanation, because then obviously if you can identify who's responsible, you can do something about it, right? And that's the next stage. And so we've seen it time and time throughout our history. I think, you know, what things like the protocols gave us, um, you know, unfortunately are you know, a very clearly defined group who are, you know, at the root of a lot of contemporary conspiracism. And we should be clear about two things, right? First is that not everybody who believes, and I'm certain of this, right? Not everybody who believes in things like, uh, 
the kind of anti-vaccine conspiracies and all the stuff that we've seen come out of COVID, right? Or anybody who talks about kind of the, the world government uh, in the way that you've seen in recent conspiracies. Not all of them are, are anti-Semitic in the the overt sense. Like they probably don't understand the origins of what they're talking about. And I think it's something really important to give this this mayor time to, to kind of shed some light on this. Because it is there, nonetheless. You are using that language, right? Even if you don't realise it. The other thing is, though, there is some rabid and obvious anti-Semitism in recent conspiracy theories. Um, and I can send you some stuff um, based on some work that I've done recently, which just, you know, it makes it clear, it makes it obvious. There is no getting away from this, right? And the connection between conspiracy theories and extreme right politics, I think, is well established. Not all conspiracy theories, in fact, most won't be um, right-wing extremists, but there is a connection between the two of them. The literature demonstrated this, right? And the connection between extreme um, conspiracy theory and extremist action, I think, is clear too. And so we need to bear those things um, in mind as well. Like these things are related, even though people often don't think to drill down into the origins of what it is they're saying. So it was fascinating that you had that. My goodness, and I've been very lucky to avoid that um, up until this point myself. I think. You know, the funny thing is, I'm not even. I'm an atheist. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't have any Jewish friends. I'm not, when I, when it's funny, when I was in prison, a lot of guys were into that stuff, you know, pro, and I, and they'd ask me about, it. I said, Oh yes, yes. I get the newsletter once a month, you know, that keeps me abreast of all the goings on of the international Jewish banking conspiracy. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's, it, it, it's ridiculous, but you're right because some of the languages, you know, the global banking system or the media and you know a lot of the times i think you're right that people don't know but these are just directed at the jewish media or the jewish bankers so that that's a very interesting part of this that i i don't i i've thought of it maybe but not as clearly as you just put it as i think that's it's very good that you brought that out yeah and just to close out the point those two examples that you raised about the banking system and the media are lifted directly from the protocols Although that's in there. That's they, I've, I've never the actually read them. I've heard of them, but I've never actually read them. I, I wouldn't recommend it. I'll, I'll read them so you so you don't have to. Um, the the protocols are basically, a, it's a, a supposedly the minutes of a secret meeting of Jewish elders where they spell out their secret plan to take over the world and talk about how it's going. And they go around the table essentially and say, okay, well, how's it going with, with the banking system? How's it going with the media? And they're going to give an update. And that oh, was, it was okay. like a, a found footage thing, but with the minutes of a meeting, I'm not putting it very well, but essentially that's some. Um, so yeah, those examples are absolutely there. I mean, I think there's something you said earlier on though, what I want to pick up on. I think that's really interesting. So if you feel as though you are somehow disenfranchised or you've been left behind politically or the world is economically, you know, really caused you problems, essentially, you are much more likely to be vulnerable to conspiracy beliefs. And what's really interesting is that you don't actually have to have been as affected as other people, right? You don't have to be at like the most uh, deprived 5% of society, socioeconomically, to believe these things. But if you believe that you are, if you feel aggrieved in some way, then you're much more open to conspiracy theories. But there's some other indicators too. Some of them are really surprising, some of them are not. Um, but that's one of the big ones, right? I think, um, and that's fascinating because actually then you can see the the logical steps towards believing in something that might seem to almost everybody else completely out there, right? Which is you want to explain what's happening to you and you can see that you're being affected by kind of something hugely powerful, which is what's going on in the political system, which is completely beyond your control, right? Um, and you you need a simple explanation. And I can see that they fulfill, so, um, and why they could be appealing. I absolutely can. Kind of like superstitions, right? Well, you know, like you, you, things correlate together or go together not, they, you, by pure happenstance. People come to associate them as being real and they want to control them. So they think if you, you know, you pray, you do a dance, you do But ultimately it comes down to trying to control forces that you have no control over. And it's often not even the force that you think it is. I mean, the gods aren't making it thunder and, and lightning to punish you for whatever it is that you think you've done. Right. So is, is would you say, is it a similar dynamic to that? Yeah, so I have this quite a lot when I have conversations about these things. So people talk about whether they are analogous to religion, whether analogous to kind of like urban legends and superstition. They're, 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 they are distinct. I mean, I think there are some obvious kind of connections in, in the, the way that you just talked about, right? So I do think that that, like I say, very human thing about reaching for explanations to the world um, is at the core of a lot of those things, right? But actually, I think 
the the mechanisms that are at play in conspiracy theories are, are slightly different, right? So you imagine that there is a uh, a human evil group controlling things. So religions generally um, we don't worship humans, and they tend to be somewhat more benign. One would say this this isn't the case. Like, there's a group of people who are explicitly responsible, and so it's a political way of looking at the world. It's a, and it's political solutions that conspiracy theorists reach for. We need to expose what's going on. We need to get those people out of power through whatever means. Those are the kind of things that people reach for. So yes and no. I mean, I think there's something distinct. And I think there's something distinct about the way conspiracy theories work today than they did, um, say, 25, 30 years ago, that is really important to understand as well, which is to do with, uh, while we might not be more conspiracy-minded in general today, and we've got, you know, the data is getting better on this, we... Um, do tend to encounter conspiracy theories in different ways. Like I think there are some structural changes that we've gone through in the last 20 years or so, which means that we interact with conspiracy theories in radically different ways to how we did before. And that's really important to think. Right. So I, like with what you just said in the last 20 years, so social media on one hand can be an excellent tool for dispelling conspiracy theories because you can go and you can say, okay, you know, this is the truth and you can have discussions, but at the same time, it's also an excellent forum for propagating conspiracy theories. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's not, I mean, anecdotal, it's not been a great means of dispelling conspiracy theories um, in some ways. I mean, so one thing about conspiracy theories are they, um, they're very hard to argue against. So if you firmly believe say, in the Great Reset, like if you're deeply engaged in that conspiracy theory, um, if you were to give me some evidence to the contrary, say, no, but that's just not happening. And here is, you know, here is some kind of fairly, you know, reliable evidence. Um, a conspiracy theorist would say, well, of course you're presenting that, right? But the real question is, where did you get the information from? Who paid for it? All those kinds of things. Yeah. Right? They're, they're what's called self-sealing arguments. So yes. any evidence you give to me to the contrary is taken as evidence in favor of my position. Yeah, it does. I, I think that's I, absolutely fascinating. I've gone. Yeah, it, it is. And it's to me, it, it's maddening as well. I mean, I had a, a debate about conspiracy theories with an old friend of mine. And I told him, look, I just looked this up. Multiple sources, they all say you're wrong. He says, but you found them on Google. Google is part of the corporate elite, whatever, whatever they are. He says, you have to go to DuckDuckGo. I said, okay. I went to DuckDuckGo. I got the same exact information. He said, no, you have to go deeper. And so what I said to him, I said, okay, so what you're telling me is I have to go until I find the source that says what you want to think, right? Because no matter what I present to you, you're going to dispel. But once you have the, the confirmation, that's going to be the reliable source. So there's not a pre-existing sort of uh, standard by which to judge whether some source is reliable. The source, the, the the standard is, does it agree with me? And if it does, then it's reliable. Yeah. Uh, so conspiracy theorists, recent conspiracy theorists are very fond of calling for debates. They're not genuine calls for debates. They're calls for this kind of interaction, right? Where actually you're going to come around to, to my evidence. Um, and the standards through which we would normally hold evidence against. So, you know, have they been... Uh, verified by kind of scientific means of the peer review that they come from a, a trusted source or institution. Conspiracy theorists reject these in general because actually they view established institutions and forms of expertise as having been compromised by whatever kind of evil force is working in the background. So yeah, absolutely, it's very hard to argue. With them. I um, I do just want to come back to social media though because I think it's sure, really sure. Hey, li listen, you're the guy here. I don't. I don't know much about this. Isn't a topic I, I know a little bit about conspiracy theories, but I want to learn more. That's that's what, why I got you on. So go ahead, back to social oh, media. Here's the problem, right? Because actually, I'm going to get waylaid by you um, having a conversation with you, and <laughs> it's going to be not giving you what, what you want at all. So um, yeah, you got in front of me if I if I go off track too. Um, right, social media is really important because if you think about the ways in which you are you would have engaged with conspiracy theories like 40 years ago or so, right? You'd read a book or a pamphlet might have told your friends in the bar and they'd have thought you know you were that kind of you were that guy at the end of the bar kind of going on about whatever um you may have gone to a convention if you're really into it you know every year or so but essentially your means of communication were, were kind of were much harder social media does two things right first of all it opens up your ability to communicate with people very quickly and access lots of different kinds of information which are not filtered through those kinds of uh 
institutional starting point those talked about before. So they're not necessarily going to be from peer review journals and that kind of thing, right? They can be elsewhere. So you can you can get information more readily and share it with other people. But it also does something really interesting. So social media gives you the ability to contribute to and add to conspiracy theories. QAnon is a really good example of this. And I'm, you, I can see you know it's a little bit, right? So yeah. I'm sure we'll come on to more, more about QAnon in a second. But essentially what QAnon asks people who are into this stuff to do is to interpret Q drops, which are these kind of odd strings of phrases and numbers and, and things, right? Um, and they're essentially, I mean, they're meaningless, right? They're, there's nothing behind them at all, except for what people say they mean. And so you've had a whole group of people who spend their time interpreting, analyzing, and giving meaning to these things. And then think about that process, right? So first of all, you look at this thing and you say, oh, there's a phrase that I've seen before, right? And you make the connection. And then you share that on social media amongst these networks. And people like it and that feels good, right? And then they share it. And then and it kind of builds the whole mythos of the conspiracy theory itself. Social media enables that to happen really, really fast and spread really, really quickly. But it is deeply embedded in the likelihood and ability of those people who are into it to participate. It's not something that stands alone. No one's written a book that says, hey, this is QAnon. I mean, they have actually, but like, no one at the time wrote a book that said, hey, this is QAnon, everybody go, this is the truth. People created that truth for themselves. They got essentially an entirely vacuous thing. I mean, if you want to think about it in this way, it was a genuinely crowdsourced conspiracy theory and popularized it. I mean, it's fascinating. And you couldn't have done that before social media. And some of the things are just seem ridiculous to me. I mean, the, the idea, if I have to listen one more time to people talk about all the pedophiles out there, like, it's just insane. Like, people are, are obsessed with this idea that there's pedophiles everywhere. And I, I, I just, I can't, I, I don't even know how to wrap my mind around, around such a thing. Like, it just doesn't, yeah. it, it, I don't know. I, I can't, I like, I'm dumbfounded. I, I'm not somebody that's ever at a loss for words, but to try to explain how that came about, I, I just, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, there are explanations and we have quite a long one if you want to, but, but how that thing came to be, right. But actually it's core kind of two things. So first of all, like some of those core claims, Hark back to what we spoke about earlier on about the protocols, right? So the idea that the the old lie of blood libel, I think, is reflected in some of the things you see uh, within uh, terms of QAnon, talking about uh, adrenochrome and that kind of thing. Right? So the, the idea that we um, kind of harvest this substance from children and, and traffic children and um, for those means and that kind of thing, right? I mean, so that's there's something at the core of it there. But I think more importantly that I think if you think about the steps you would have to go through to believe all of the things that have been kind of put forward by QAnon, right? So the, you know, the idea that Hollywood celebrities and Hillary Clinton and so on have been, I don't know, either, depending on what you read, uh, taken to Guantanamo Bay or already executed, but they've been replaced by a clone or something like that. You have to rationalise what's going on to ever increasing, increasingly extreme steps in order to preserve the theories being true, right? And QAnon is a really sad theory, in look, like, genuinely sad in some ways, right? Because actually, it's never going to come to fruition. You're never going to resolve it or find the truth. Um, because actually, that's always, it's not there, right? So you um, you end up end, uh, getting to a point where people are always saying, okay, well, soon the truth will be revealed. You know, stand fast, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, and that, that seems like kind of poignant. There seems these people who are kind of searching for something that isn't ever going to happen. What they have found, though, is a very close network. I mean, QAnon's full of, like, intropes and phrases and things that people, you know, where we go one, we go all, and that kind of thing, right? They use to recognize each other. Um, and if you look for those things, and if you look for the symbols, which are also really important to QAnon, like the one eye thing and so on, right? Um, if you look for them, you'll find them. So let's think about how that would work, right? So if I say to you, you know, so you're a complete cynic about this particular idea, the whole QAnon thing, right? And I said, okay, fine. First of all, I'm not going to tell you. Right? I can't tell you the truth. You have to find out for yourself. You need to go and, you know, key phrase, like, do your own research. Oh, my God, yes. I've heard I've yeah. heard that. Or, yeah, you have to do your research. Well, let's think about what that really means. So I said, okay, Tom Hanks, hypothetically, is, is, okay, we should say, by the way, this is all nonsense, right? Of course he isn't. But Tom Hanks is in on this. So you've got to go and you've got to look for top evidence of Tom Hanks, maybe giving the, um, the Illuminati symbol or something like that, right? Yeah? 
Now you can imagine how many hundreds of thousands of photos of Tom Hanks you're going to find if you go on a Google image search or something. And I guarantee one of them is going to be like winking or is perhaps a yeah, or something, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And suddenly you're like, whoa, that's the thing, right? You found the evidence and that's your first step in. And then you start looking for more and kind of you read more of this stuff and you research more, but you're always looking not for like general evidence of and weighing them up in a kind of like logical way, but evidence to support the theory. And that point you're on because you've had that moment of revelation. I think it's incredibly fascinating and also incredibly addictive. Like people really get pulled into this. You know, you said that you're looking for something and ultimately it's never there. When I was incarcerated, I think it was about 2003, and this went on for years, something became very popular in prison. It was the sovereign citizen, some such thing. And basically what they were saying was that you are not really you. No, the government has your name, but that's not that, that's just your, a name they have. It's not really you. That's a straw man. You have to reclaim your identity, and then they will have to let you out of prison. And this was all based on the enacting clause that they're supposed to be in statute books, a, a fringe flag that they have in courtrooms. I mean, this this stuff went on and on. But the funny thing was, is he kept saying, this one guy anyways, I just got to get the one more book. I mean, he had stacks of books, thousands of dollars, and it was always just the next book was going to hold that key to turn the lock. He was building up the information, building up the arsenal, and he was going to get out of prison. And a lot of guys believe this. And my response to him was, hold on a second. So you're saying that there's this massive organization out there. And they're controlling all this stuff. And, they, and they've got you in prison illegally. They've taken over the government. They've taken over everything. But if you provide them with this, they're going to say, oh, you got us? And then let you go? It just defies any type of logic you could possibly have. But in that guy's case, he was doing 60 years. So I could get it. Okay, you want to get out of prison. You don't want to die in prison. So you're going to hold on to any thread of hope you can. But that just seems to be the mindset that I'm going to keep going, keep looking and, and not accept any disconfirming evidence. And it just never stops. Yeah, because it's the process itself. So this opportunity thing is really interesting, by the way. It's starting to appear over in the UK as well. Um, slightly distinct, but I think those mechanisms are the same, right? Which, look, you want to explain what's going on. You want to find hope for your situation. I mean, it may not be in the same, uh, exactly the same as, as your example, right? But imagine during the pandemic, let's say you, you worked in retail or you owned a bar or something, right? And lockdown has shut you down and you're worried financially, you know, are you going to be able to keep your business? Like you need to find ways to deal with that, I think. And these kinds of beliefs are really, you know, in some ways, you know, helpful and kind of easily accessible means of doing that, right? The thing is as well, the other really sad thing is they don't help you. The evidence, okay, so first of all, it's obviously not going to be going to happen, right? So you might say, okay, so what? And this guy wants to believe in this and it, you know, kind of gets him through the day. That's absolutely fine. The evidence is it doesn't make you any happier. You know, it, it doesn't provide the kinds of answers that you're looking for, at least in the evidence that we've got so far, right? Um, you know, I've always I've thought about this quite a lot because there's a big debate over, you know, do conspiracy theories fulfill a useful function in society and i think like to an extent they do right they do give us a way of kind of expressing even our agency when we don't have any but like your guy in prison they had very little um options available to him to yeah. express himself like frustration with the system and you know in, in any really meaningful way they give you an outlet and i think that's okay i think we need to be realistic about the harms as well certainly in recent forms of conspiracy theory that you that come along with it and i just think you need to kind of have that, that broader conversation it's really easy to go these people are crabs. Um, you know, we should just, you know, they're just dumb and we shouldn't speak to them at all. We should just ignore them. And I don't think that's true. I think um, actually when you really think about what function these things fulfill and, and why people believe in them, yeah, I think it's it's worth engaging with those kind of bigger ideas. Are you aware of any large-scale conspiracies that have turned out to be true the reason i asked is because i keep hearing the conspiracy theorists keep saying we've been right over the last three years and my my response is you're saying you're right because you're vindicated amongst yourselves nobody outside of your loop is saying you've been correct all along 
every new piece of data that comes forward, you're saying, okay, look, it proves this, but that's not how it's being interpreted. Of course, that doesn't mean you're wrong because other people don't accept it. People don't accept all kinds of things throughout history that turned out to be true, but you can't say it's generally accepted. One of the things that they say now is generally accepted is that COVID came from the lab. No, people are taking a look at it. Yes. And it's true. It, it has far more adherence than it did at the beginning, but it's nowhere near the universally accepted theory that conspiracy theorists seem to think that it is or with the vaccines and all the harm they're causing. You're watching these videos of people dropping dead and you're saying, look, it's proving us right. But the vast majority of people don't believe that. So it's like, it's just a self-confirmation over and over and over again. It's like a feedback loop. So that's why I'm asking you, are you aware of any that actually turned out to be true? Yeah. So three things to say, one of them is really quick. And then two, like things that I think really address what you want to get into, right? Okay. The first is just to say on the, um, <laughs> the died suddenly thing, right? So the, the, I'm assuming that's the movie that you're talking about or that, that trend that's been going around. Actually, there are, there's hidden evidence of vaccine harms and look at the athlete who's just like dropped down. Yeah, that kind of thing. Right? There is it's all shit of the highest degree. Yeah, I mean there is zero there is zero evidence of this, and we should be real, you know, real clear about that. Um, and the kind of proponents of those uh, films and that information are just you know, way off. There is a well-funded anti-vaccine movement that existed way before COVID that is yeah. engaged in this sort of thing. So that's um the first thing, <laughs> and I think it's um really important to say that. Um, yeah, in terms of things that happen, right? I teach a course on this stuff. Um. And the last week of that course is who cares who killed JFK, right? Um, it's it, because the thing about conspiracy theories is, right, they can be true. There have always been conspiracy theories that have turned out to be true, sometimes years later. Yeah. Um, I am going to guarantee that you believe in some kind, of conspiracy, some kind of conspiracy theory. I'm guaranteed that you've seen some kind of evidence to support it. Um, and I think we all do, right? I don't. But the point is, it doesn't matter. Conspiracy theories are important because a they help us to explain what's going on in like really uncertain times. But b they um are reliant on a mistrust of governments, of expertise, of public institutions to a degree. I think at uh, the most extreme, where it it can be harmful both to individuals themselves, but also to like our confidence in democracy in general, right? And confidence in politics in general. That's why conspiracy theories are important. So there are loads to give you a, a, an answer to like the, your starting point. There's loads of examples of conspiracy theories that have turned out to be true because we know governments lie to their people at the time, right? <laughs> yeah. um, like they always have and they always will. And sometimes we accept those lies as being being reasonable, right? Sure. You know, we might conceal the truth about some secret weapons pro program because we don't want to give um, a kind of a, an advantage to one of our kind of global adversaries. Yeah. We might not tell anybody the truth about that meteor that's going to crash into Earth in a couple of years' time because you know, we don't want to spark a global panic. I think we would accept those sorts of things as actions as a government, right? But there's been some real dark and malign actions, even in relatively recent history. Of course there have. Um, but the point is the uncertainty. Conspiracy theories take hold not when you know for certain what's going on, but say COVID was made in a lab or something like that. That's not when they, they take hold. They take hold when we don't know what's happening. We're looking for explanations. And it's how that plays out that I think is the really important thing. What do you believe? I'm really curious. Do you do you have any conspiracist beliefs? Um, I distrust government. I, I think that governments lie. That that's the bottom line. I mean, look, they lied about the Maine. They lied about the Lusitania. They lied about the Gulf of Tonkin. They were. I'm not going to say they lied about the weapons of mass destruction. They certainly were wrong about it. That doesn't surprise me. But the thing is, all that has come out, right? So with what you just said, it reminds me of the gambler's fallacy. Because yes, some conspiracy theories, theories can turn out to be true. And then they say, look, I'm right. And it reminds me of a guy that gambles and he tells me, look how much money I won. And I say, yeah, asshole, but what have you done for the last five years when all the money you've lost? But yeah. that's just ignored. And you're just looking for that one hit. So like the way I approach things, I think it's perfect, perfectly possible, for instance, that the CIA assassinated John Kennedy. However, the, the main thing or one of the main things on which that, you know, was the hook on that which that was hung was that the bullet couldn't have done what was claimed. I watched the program on CPTV with a cellmate of mine who happened to be very knowledgeable about firearms. And they did a reenactment of the shooting and they showed 
it could have happened exactly like they said it did. I mean, they fired the gun the same distance. And I and my cellmate said, yes, th th that's true. There, there, There's nothing hinky there. Okay, so now I know that could be true. The standard version could absolutely be true. Okay, so then why do I need another version? Could it be? Certainly. But I don't need to go hunting for it. You know, the, the idea with the with the trade towers that the, it, it was an inside job and it couldn't burn and it couldn't this and all, I don't know enough about temperature and steel to know what's what. What I do know is that I saw on television a plane hit that building. There's That's unequivocal, right? I know that. I saw a video of Ayman Zawahiri uh, and Osama bin Laden talking about the attacks. Of course, the conspiracy theorists can say, well, that's fudged. The other day, I'll give you just a, you know example, is I was talking to a conspiracy theorist and he said, do you believe COVID's a real thing? And I said, well, I know when I was in prison, people that died from it and people that got very sick. He says, yeah, but how do you know it wasn't the flu? And I said, see, there's the problem right there. I said, because you only know about the flu because, it's, because doctors have told you about it. You've trusted those doctors. So you're you're saying they're trustworthy about this and then arbitrarily saying, but not about this because you want to believe this is the conspiracy. The bottom line is I know I wouldn't know the flu virus if I saw it under a microscope, right? I wouldn't know bronchitis. There's all types of things that I wouldn't recognize. I only know because experts have told me and it seems to be working out well because lifespan's going up and up and up and up. So that seems to be what they do. And I say that because when they say to me, oh, well, you're trusting what the media tells you about the trade towers. Okay, that's fine. But I only know that Osama bin Laden exists because the media tells me. I only know George W. Bush exists because I saw him on television. I've never met the guy personally. So you, you have to rely on things that you don't have immediate knowledge of. And they're doing it also. They're just arbitrarily slicing where they want to to say, okay, I'm not going to accept that. So, so I don't think that answers the question about what conspiracies I believe in, but that's my general outlook on the on the topic. No, really interesting. And actually, I think you touched on something that, that's really important about um, this idea of trust and like generalized mistrust within conspiracy theories. I think it's so important. So by the way, I, I agree to an extent. I think a healthy mistrust of government, what governments can do is probably a good thing. I think um, there are boundaries to which you want to push that. And I think conspiracy theories maybe push those boundaries. With my class this year, we did, um, there's a, oh, there's loads of these, but like generalized tests of conspiracy belief. And so we did these. And I was really surprised, right? Because I thought they'd all be kind of super cynical about that, everything. But they're not. They were um, much more trusting of their governments than I was. And I came out as much more conspiracist as they were, <laughs> than they were as a result. I thought it was fascinating, you know? Um, but the thing is this, there are some things that you need to take on trust. And it's not trust as in like someone who you don't know comes up to you on the street and tells you something. They're trust because they're embedded with institutions and practices and norms and expertise that we all know, right? So you go to your doctor. He tells you that you need this intervention or to, to go on this regime of drugs because otherwise, you know, your problem's going to keep getting worse. But you may choose to take that on a face value. You may choose a second opinion. You may want to find out, right? But at some point, you're going to accept their knowledge is greater than yours. There are other things in society that we need to take on trust as well, which are really important. So the classic is um, an election, right? You cast your vote in an election. You have no means of verifying how everybody else in the country voted. Right? You can't go around practically and count all their votes. So no. we need a system of checks. We need a system of institutions and practices, which mean that we can be as confident as we can be that everybody's vote was counted correctly. Um, and that the result that came out the other end is the result that was close to fair as we can get, as close to accurate result as we can get. Right? Now, if you don't believe in those things, if you don't have confidence in those institutions, there are some real problems further down the line, I think, in terms of how politics and democracy um, and public institutions work. Now, the real obvious outcome is something like January the 6th, right? So I don't believe in that in what happened. I'm going to go and do something about it, and I'm going to reclaim the true result of the election myself. I think it's something more pernicious, which is probably even even more harmful, which is this generalized lack of trust in what it is that governments do for you. Now, the extent of that, I think, is really interesting because I suspect, like you, that I have um, a degree of cynicism over this sort of thing, but actually an acceptance that we do have to, at some point, believe what we're told. 
Now, where those boundaries are, I think, is different for everybody, and that's okay. But the distinction with conspiracy theorists is that they almost never believe what they're told. Their starting point is always... Well, it's worse than that, though. But it's worse than that, right? Because it's not just a matter of skepticism. See, I have skepticism of government. But I don't then, because of my skepticism, plug in an alternative reality that I claim to know about. And that's the seems to me the difference is, yes, I think they lie. There's plenty of things I don't know, but I don't then say, OK, there's the X, Y, Z organization and they meet in Amsterdam every year and, and they spread their propaganda this way. That it, it's just it's hubris, you know, hubris more than than I can even any other word I can come up with to assume that, you know, so much and it, from these people, and that's another thing I used to tell guys in prison is this, look, you're telling me that this organization has the power to start wars, to crash economies, to fix elections. They basically control everything on the planet, but they can't stop you from reading about it in prison. It just defies logic. But in that, but that to me is the, is where the problem is. It's not just with the distrust. It's then with the fabrication of a, a narrative or a story that explains it all with stuff that you couldn't possibly know, even if it were true. Yeah. Like I say, and it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. It's the explanation. That's the key thing, right? The starting point is always that there's this conspiracist explanation for what's going on in the world, that this group of people, whatever name we want to give them, right? Um, this group of people are, are directing things, but it feels good to have that knowledge, right? It feels good to be in the group who are kind of, on the, on the side of truth, on the side of light, who understand what's happening. And most people don't, right? Those sheep all don't understand. If only we can convert them to our cause or that kind of thing. Um, you know, we'll be able to do something about this. That feels good, I think, you know. I mean, there is a real kind of a sense of community that you see in recent conspiracy movements. I mean, QAnon is one, right? But you see this all the time through the kind of the uh, anti-COVID, for want of a better term, movement, certainly in the UK. I'm, I'm less clear about how it's been playing out in the states right that these people recognize each other that they form associations that they find the kind of evidence that you're talking about however kind of vacuous they find it themselves and spread it and that there's some kind of social benefit to it so it's it's not as if they're just rejecting government and rejecting expertise like they are getting some tangible result from what they're, they're believing and part of that is just establishing connections with other people right there's a payoff in other words, it like, always is. yeah, there's a payoff for them. Yeah, that, yeah. It, 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 I, I would assume so. I mean, all human behavior, people engage in it because it works on some level, no matter what, no matter what it is. And what do you so, know? I, conspiracy theorists in, in theories must be the same. Yeah, and, and don't imagine these as um, like atomized individuals, like people in their their parents' basement, kind of on the computer, that kind of thing, right? Like, yeah, maybe to an extent, some of them are right. I'm sure, but like, hey, like, lots of people are. I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years attending uh, rallies and protests that have been organized by a conspiracy theorist movement in the UK. And I, the first couple I turned up to, I expected people who were completely crazy, who were guys who kind of generally resemble the extreme right, not the case incidentally, um, and people who were kind of descend to violence at the drop of a hat. None of those things were true. I was completely confounded. Um, there is such a range of people who get hooked into this sort of thing. They're not who you would expect. Almost every social group can. Um, they are rarely violent, or there is a clear pathway to violence for some people. And incidentally, we've just done some survey work. There is uh, the kind of people who are into this stuff, like around 60, 65% of them in general believe that violence can be justified at their rallies, at the protests, and things, which I think is really, really fascinating. Um, so there are people who can be con converted to it because the conspiracy is caused. But the biggest thing I got from it, from spending a couple of years doing this work, was that it's a really joyous social occasion. Like these people turn up, honestly, and the first thing they do is they, they see friends they haven't seen for a few weeks. They come right across the country to go to this rally or this protest, and they're hugging each other, and they're kind of catching up. And it's actually quite nice. And I can see something really, you were talking about tangible payoffs, right? I can see some real benefits, some real payoffs to doing that in a period where for the last couple of years you've not been able to see anybody, at least not in the same way, and you've been really worried. I, I get that. Um, you know, they... It, it resembles nothing else other than like a, a party or a really crap festival with, by the way, truly terrible music. Always played <laughs> it. I mean, the worst kind of 90s crap you can imagine, right? But um, 
I guess the point that I'm making is that there is something behind it that people don't often see. And that association thing, that that network, that payoff that you get is you, know, you shouldn't discount it. You know, if you if you're into one of these these ideas, you know, if you're into QAnon and you see somebody else who's really into QAnon, or you communicate with them online, you get something back. That's fascinating. Really is. Okay. Uh Rod, can I call you Rod? Is it oh, okay? Please. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Rod. Before I let you go, is there anything we left out? Anything that you that you think that you, people should know about when it comes to these topics? Yeah, look, I, I know you're going to be exploring this a little bit more. Um, and so, and I know the other people that you're talking to are going to be um, saying a lot more about the dynamics of conspiracy belief and how they change over time. Like, um, you know, you'll get a lot more information on that. I think the things that I want to talk about, uh, two things I want to leave you with. First of all, this idea that don't imagine there is one conspiracy theorist out there, like one identical conspiracy theorist. Like, there's a lots of different kinds of people. There are lots of pathways into these sorts of beliefs. Um, and they don't all end up in the same place. So not everybody who's into this stuff is gonna go out there and shoot up Comet Pizza in Washington, right? That's not what's gonna happen. But for all of them, those harms, I think, uh, are present. And we need to think about those harms like much more broadly. So we need to think about the obvious harms if you end up with a kind of, some kind of extremist act or some kind of direct act of violence. You need to think about the harms on the individual. And there's some really sad stories out there about people who've kind of fallen down the QAnon rabbit hole, or fallen down some other rabbit hole, um, and have lost contact with their families and so on. Like, there are some definite um, problems resulting for this. But I think we shouldn't discount these broader problems for society. Like, if none of us believe anything, then we're not going to believe in the society that we created for ourselves, however randomly, over, over hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think that's a profoundly dangerous thing. Um, yeah, that's that's what I would say. Thank you so much for the chat. I really Thank enjoyed you. it. Do you have a website or anywhere people can find you and f- find your writings, your ideas? Uh, so I guess I'm I'm super Googleable. Um, if you believe in Google, then you'll find me. Um, and I have a bit on the King's website. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, that really tickled me when you said it. Uh, yes, uh, Google me and you'll find my stuff. I tend to do <laughs> like the more boring scholarly stuff. Um, but also alongside that, things that everyone else can read. So I'm sure you see it. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. For now, I'm Michael Leibowitz. This is the Rational Egoist signing out. Remember, like, share, comment, and subscribe. Until next time.